Good evening and welcome to Byline. This is a public affairs show here at Amherst Media and it's co-sponsored by the Amherst League of Women Voters. And uh, we have a, a special guest here tonight as we continue to try to understand how the transition to our new government system is working. And of course one of the biggest parts of our uh, town council's work every year will be forming the budget. And one of the biggest parts of the budget, in fact the biggest part of the budget, is of course public education and uh, we have our superintendent of schools Dr. Michael Morris here with us today to talk with us about uh, first about the process and his experience uh, as he's going through uh, working in this new system uh, because uh, how many budgets have you done here in Amherst prior to this? This would be my third. This is your third budget so uh, you weren't there doing it that long before but you got you got that down <laughs> and now uh, we're, we're heading into a, a different system here so uh, let's start with just your reaction to how it's going and uh, how it feels differently to you or not. Sure so I think uh, in general, what I find to be the same is that when I'm in front of, for instance, the Finance Committee, where I was yesterday for the elementary school district, it already went for the regional schools, uh, I think the concerns uh, are the same and the interest is the same to make sure that we have a high quality school system that is fiscally sustainable. And so I'm very appreciative that the Finance Committee in a town uh, is supportive of that first as well as the second then. Uh, mm -hmm. Some of my colleagues don't enjoy that flexibility perhaps or the same interest, but uh, the questions I receive and similar to how I've received them historically have been ensuring that we're being, uh, we're making fiscal decisions that aren't just one year fiscal decisions, but they're, they're sustainable for the future because everyone's commitment is that we have high quality public education, pre-K to 12 in the town of Amherst. And, and that's something that I think speaks volumes about the elected officials, elected appointed officials in our community. Um, this year, because of the transition government, we followed pretty much the same timeline. Uh, one thing that I was speaking about with the Amherst Finance Committee yesterday is um, for the regional schools, that's sort of locked in because of the other three town, town meeting schedules. Mm -hmm. For the Amherst public schools, at least theoretically, we'd be able to push that back a bit. And something that I have an interest in thinking about is we released the first draft of our budget in January before the governor releases the, that budget, the House One budget. And that sometimes is hard not that we're so dependent on state funding, but there are years, this being actually one of them, where there's a lot of discussion of educational funding. And to come out with our budget before we have even the governor's first guidance to the legislature, uh, sometimes it's felt a little awkward and, and it's hard to communicate to the community when there are changes that we have to make changes along with it in our budget. But that's not new to this process. That is part of the system that has been around for a long time and is likely to continue for a long time. That's right. And our conversation last night, at least for the Amherst Elementary School budget, is, is a couple weeks would actually make a significant difference of when we release our budget. And because we don't have the other three towns, towns meetings, or now Amherst town meeting, uh, to get Warren articles on, might we have flexibility to think even slightly differently, might, might yield really positive results for how we approach the budget and, and how we communicate the budget to a larger community and not feeling like it changes throughout the process so much. And for those who are new here in town, we should point out that you're actually a superintendent of two different school systems. You wear two hats and you have two school committees that you're working with. Tell us about that. Sure. So, so for including our friendly neighbors uh, of Pelham, it's three school districts. Um, but for Amherst particularly, uh, the Amherst Elementary Schools, pre-K to 6, are its own unique school district with its own school committee, its own budget. And the Amherst Pelham Regional School District is a four-town school district of Amherst, Pelham, Leverett, and Shootsbury that covers this, or governs the 7th through 12th grade students in our district. Uh, and it's a regional school district, which has significant differences in terms of what the superintendent role is. I mean, the regional district is its own separate entity. It's not a municipal unit, form of municipal government in the same way. On do formal documents, I'm the quote unquote CEO of the regional schools where I'm not at the elementary schools, which sometimes feels, uh, it's an interesting relationship, but from a budgetary financial point of view, there is no relationship between those two entities. They each have their own budget. And so by the way I framed my question, which you uh, rightly corrected me on, 
I'm sort of projecting forward a little bit because there's a separate effort that's been going on right. to look at the question of whether the uh, small school system of Pelham and the small school system of Pelham Elementary right. and the small school system of Amherst Elementary should be combined. Why don't you take a second and tell us where that stands? Sure. So there was a two-town meeting on April 13th where representatives, elected officials from those two towns came together to look at the work that had happened. At this point, um, there was some sense that um, the timing may not be right for to, to further consider that change given uh, a number of variables. One, the state funding system. Um, second is that we do have a new form of government in the town of Amherst. Um, and so I think in the next few weeks, we're taping this in, in early to mid-May, uh, there's going to be a decision by that regionalization board whether to proceed or whether to um, stop and have this be an artifact in case this wants to be studied again in the future. So they're, they're making so that So if they decide not to move forward, the committee dissolves at that point or does it stay in place? They do, uh, they would vote to, to likely to vote to dissolve. Okay. Exactly. And if the conversation needed to be restarted at a later date, the two communities would have to go through a process of deciding to form a new regionalization study committee and make decisions at that time as to membership, timing, and charge. Uh, but you would not anticipate that to happen uh, immediately, but it could happen again in the future. Absolutely, and I think the work of the board, whether it ends up being moving forward or not, will still be helpful for the communities to better understand how would regional transportation aid contribute. The financial piece was studied in depth. The governance, you know, how, how would you transition from municipal form of governance to a regional one? Um, I think all of the information that board has, whether it, it materializes anything tangible now or not, still critically important because the question comes up all the time and we have mm -hmm. a tremendous amount more information thanks to the, the tireless work of the board than we had beforehand. Yeah. And of course by then uh, the state will hopefully have uh, concluded their most recent effort at education reform which uh, the last one was done in the early 90s and carried forward even until today. Uh, and usually when they conclude that process and there's a lot of pressure and the governor, the speaker, and the Senate president have all said that they expect within this two-year legislative term to act finally on another reform package. Those packages usually get implemented over a 7 to 10, 15 year period so there would be more information and more security as to knowing what the future would look like if another regionalization study committee were formed uh, in another year or two or three uh, because we'd be in a new pattern that would likely continue for a long time. I think that's true. I think the other thing that perhaps could be uh, new information that might emerge from that is many people at DESE, including the deputy commissioner, have, have talked about the benefits from their point of view of regionalization. And it's what's unknown is, and there was a, the state auditor last year um, St. Arthur Bump came out with a large report on regionalization. So what's unclear is in any new package what impact would have on districts that are considering regionalization. And, and right now that's an unknown and, and a year or two from now I think we'll have a lot more information that okay. will be able to be considered. Good. So let's go back to the budget sure. now. And um, so uh, you've presented your budget. Uh, the budget is before the town council. The finance committee will be doing its work and some public hearings I believe. and and they'll be playing this out over the next few months. So during um, that period of time, uh, we need to understand as they look at the education side of, of the uh, proposal, um, what's the headline here? What, what, is, what should we be looking for and thinking about when we think about the budget that you've proposed for our elementary schools and for our regional middle and high school? Sure. So why don't I start with the regional schools, the secondary schools, uh, because the Amherst Town Council has already voted on those at this date, at the date of this taping. And two other towns, Leverett and Shoots Bay, have voted affirmatively, and, and time is taping Pelham's voting tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And so uh, at, what's true in both budgets I should start with is that we're having a, an unusually positive budget year for a couple of reasons. One is that we had a pretty significant reduction in health care costs. 
Um, the second is that we've tried... How was that achieved? That was achieved through the town um, and the change from being self-insured to joining a group insurance policy or yeah. program, and that has uh, netted some significant savings for the districts okay. as well as the town. Towns, I should say. Pelham is also part of that same okay. insurance group. So kudos. Kudos to the town. efficiency move. So yeah. thank you, town manager and town council. Absolutely. Okay. Um, and so the other thing that I think we've been very intentional about is looking at declining enrollment, uh, which is kind of stagnating a little bit, but we've had the decline. And doing a, the principals in particular have done a fantastic job analyzing uh, how do we match that with, with the appropriate staffing? So where are places we can add staffing in areas that we need it, and where are places that through natural attrition uh, we can remove it just because of that declining enrollment and we've realized some we've realized some significant savings from that and been able to redistribute that in, in areas that are consistent with our values. I mean for me a budget is a values document mm -hmm. and we're in a fortunate place where we're able to express that this year in perhaps better ways than in the past. We also want to be conscious that every year is not going to be this year. Some of the health insurance savings is one-time savings and mm -hmm. as I said some of the declining enrollment uh, based on our projections and our, re our experiences looks like it's kind of plateauing. So we want to also build things in in this positive variance year that we we don't have to necessarily rely on. So we're we're trying to both do the things to support our add the things we need to support our students and also being very realistic that we're not going to be in this fortunate situation here from and now. And what are some of the things that you're adding to serve the students better? Yeah. So at the regional level, we're adding a second restorative practice technician uh, a practitioner. So we have had one. There's a second year at the high school that we've had a position like that. And, and what does that position do? Yeah, we're adding one at the middle school. And what that position has been a, a lot of interest, both nationally and locally, on how much, how discipline is um, doled out at, the sec at, at all schools, but particularly at the secondary level. And one of the legitimate critiques of K-12 education is that it often uh, comes from a, a, even though it's called natural consequence, it more, feels more punitive. It doesn't actually repair the harm that's done. And most of our, con our uh, behavior challenges, there is someone who is harmed and there's a harm doer. Um, but unless that relationship is repaired, it's very likely that that same trend will continue. The idea of so this fits into anti-bullying and um, the like conflict Abs resolution, anti-bullying, and, and it also fits in in terms of uh, the cultural aspect. So one of the critiques of, of of all districts, and we're not excluded from that, is what's the demographics of who gets suspended more often or less often. Mm -hmm. And it's really working proactively with students, with staff and faculty to how do we create a climate in our school where students can be leaders in some of that conflict resolution, where we're highly conscious of cultural impacts and biases that we all have in that approach. And we did recently a show here actually at Amherst Media with one of the student leaders as well as the practitioner. And it's amazing the impact it's had already on the schools and we want to expand that impact. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the things we're really excited about. We are revising our math curriculum in grades 6 through 12, which cuts across multiple districts. Our sixth graders right mm -hmm. now are in the elementary schools. And so those are, again, talking about one-time cost. We want to not just uh, replace the curriculum, uh, which came out of an external review, but also provide support for teachers to be able to implement a new curriculum. So we have a one-year position that is really coaching teachers on new curriculum, supporting students within that. Um, and again, that's the financial sustainability part as well. And that decision and program was driven by a, an external report that said... Yeah, so we, we, it was driven by community, staff, parent, um, guardian, as well as student concerns about our current curriculum. So we did have an external review, and what they found was that our curriculum wasn't well aligned to the current standards, um, and so we needed to address that. The other thing they, under, they underscored um, within that was that right now the type of math teaching that our students need, that problem solving that, that and frankly, employers and colleges are saying we need to have, uh, right now, our philosophy at the middle school didn't match our philosophy at the high school, and we heard that directly from students. Um, so we want to have a balanced curriculum that emphasizes problem solving as well as computational fluency. That's never going away, no matter what's in our phones and how quickly we can do it. There, there's some parts of that that you need to access higher, quali higher level mathematics. And so there, there's a cost related to both the curriculum and also the professional development and training that we want to support our teachers to best support student outcomes. Okay. Uh, other initiatives that sure. this budget's going to make possible? Sure. At the elementary level, we have um, 
We're starting a dual language program. We were very fortunate to get, a, along with the Holyoke Public Schools, a joint grant for $300,000 supporting the implementation of that program at Fort River School. But there's still ongoing needs. That's really for this spring and summer. There's ongoing needs for the program, so we do want to support. We're buying a new curriculum, right? If we don't have an existing Spanish language curriculum that aligns. And mm -hmm. one of the choices that our staff made that, are, that we're all supporting and excited about is they want to make sure not just that it's um, a different curriculum, the Spanish class and English class, but actually to reform uh, have really uh, a, a very streamlined but um, in-depth um, joint curriculum so that if you're in the Spanish, if the students are in the Spanish class or the English class, they're getting the same high quality text, they're getting the same um, types of teaching. So at Fort River we're actually, we were thinking about it more narrowly and the teachers were telling us no, if we want kids to have this, all kids to have this experience, we want all kids to have access to um, kind of revised curriculum. So there are some costs, they're not huge, but they're related to that. Uh, one of the ongoing needs in the town of Amherst has been access to early, high quality early, child, early childhood education. Uh, we do have a program at Crocker Farmer Preschool program, but that is a state uh, driven program around students with special needs. There are typical peers that are associated. But what we know, and we've done some surveying, actually community led group did some surveying, is that cost is a major factor for many families in our community. So mm -hmm. families with children without special needs, um, there aren't, um, we have a wonderful community action um, program, a Head Start program. It, there are more families that can access that program. So what we're partnering with the town of Amherst as well as the elementary schools is to provide almost a grant for us to work, all three entities, the town, the schools, and Head Start. What would it look like if we were to expand access? How close could we get to universal preschool access for income eligible families in town? And so again, not a huge budget item in terms of cost, but maybe down the road. But we've tried multiple ways to increase our preschool access over the last 15 years, and, and we haven't gotten there. And we have this existing gem, in my opinion. I've been over to Community Actions right next to Wildwood, one of the mm -hmm. sites. What they do for children and families is outstanding. And how do we, as a school district, who are the beneficiaries of their work, how do we support them? How does the town support them? Because we know that when students arrive in kindergarten without preschool access, that, that their outcomes are, are demonstrably different than mm -hmm. students who, who do have and There's that. a lot of hidden poverty here in Amherst because yeah. we're an academic community and uh, there are relatively high salaries associated with people who are affiliated with the colleges. Uh, people think of this as a relatively wealthy community, but the reality is whether they're students who have come here to study and are married with children or whether they're people who've lived in this community and are the next generation of many generations living in the community, yeah. uh, there's a lot of people who uh, basically don't have that, uh, that high level of income that we're perceived to have generally in town. And that presents itself in different ways uh, uh, in the school system. Yeah, one of the things that I like to say when people uh, say, oh, Amherst, it's probably all affluent families and they have, they have this perception is that we're one of about three or four communities across the Commonwealth uh, if you look at our school population, that actually average the, our um, our averages are the same as the state average in terms of race, ethnicity, poverty, uh, English language learners, special needs students, and sadly because of residential segregation, there's not many communities that actually are at the state averages, and we are. So one of the exciting things is we're, we're this microcosm of the Commonwealth, and what an opportunity uh, we've in our math classrooms. There'll be one student whose parent may be. Uh, professor of mathematics and another student who to get in that seat has this amazingly rich life story of how they got to be in Amherst and they're getting to learn from one another and what a joy that is and yeah. that's one of the reasons people like me stick around in this district it's my 18th year and uh, we also have to respond to that with the appropriate staffing to make sure all students can access um, the full, full extent of the curriculum. And that's one of the reasons why so many people call education the great equalizer in our society and uh, we uh, recently interviewed uh, our um, uh, library director and same thing uh, you know the library is available to everybody the schools available to everybody and it's about creating an opportunity and an environment in which no matter where you come from no matter what your background is no matter what's happening at home that you have a safe and encouraging place in which you can grow and develop and Again, whether you're doing it in the schools as a child or a young person, or you're doing it in the library as an adult and a person living in the community, those should be safe and, and dynamic places where you can go to improve yourself and, and take advantage of everything that this country is supposed to be about. Right. 
Okay. So um, let's uh, switch gears here for a couple sure. of minutes. Um, uh, the um, school construction. So sure. there's a lot of activity around school construction. So uh, give us uh, uh, give us the highlights of where we are in the various efforts to assess our schools and apply for um, grant funding and and the like. Sure. So um, I think. The, the two pieces I want to talk about is there's short to medium term things we're doing and then long term things we're doing. I'll start with the long term, but uh, but I don't want to lose track. The long term is more expensive, right? It is. Yeah, so that's the start, one we need grants let's for. Start with, <laughs> let's start with the big picture. Huh? Sure. The big picture is that we are hoping to replace our, our outdated elementary schools, particularly Wildwood and Fort River. So we went through an extensive community outreach process this winter and early spring. And what we found is that a uh, proposal that I suggested, uh, which was um, looking at a 600 student school to replace those two outdated schools, which would involve some other changes that we're exploring, uh, had community support to move forward. So that proposal had to be in the statement of interest. MSBA, which is a state funding agency on this front, on this area, uh, asked us to, you know, build consensus in the community. So we had nine public forums on the topic. We got a tremendous amount of feedback from both parents in the district, staff in the district, and community members at large. And that led to unanimous votes of, again, both the school committee and the Amherst Town Council to submit a statement of interest. So that statement of interest was submitted in early April. State gets many of them. They do a thorough review. And in, on December 11th at the MSBA, and their, their board meeting, they'll vote on which grants they're willing to accept and invite into the process. So we're keeping our fingers crossed, and uh, but we really do appreciate the engagement of the community. It wasn't a simple, um, mm -hmm. narrow discussion. It was really a pretty thorough one. And thank Amherst Media for videotaping 15 minute one, which led off all the sessions so people get a sense of what we were talking about. And so if that process kicks off uh, in December, if we get positive news in December, that starts off a roughly five year process of uh, analysis, more deeper analysis can and then construction. Uh, we're really the beneficiaries that we had a Wildwood building project that wasn't successful. We have a tremendous amount of data and the town took on a Fort River feasibility study. So we now have more data, I would say, about those two sites than any applicant to the MSBA process. So I feel like we will be well versed to take quick action if we are invited in. So that longer term, big vision, big project, what's the rough cost anticipated? I know five years out it's hard to predict the exact cost, but right. Um, in today's dollars or by today's some kind of measure, how would you describe the scale right. of the project in relation to cost? Right. So it's, it's a hard one to judge also because the MSBA reimbursement is unclear until they tell us. So I, I'm right. going to be cautious about my description, but um, the, co the cost is certainly north of, total cost is certainly north of $50 million. Um, and the town cost, I think, is, is likely north of $30 million. Um, but I think everything, anything beyond that is, is getting into the weeds. That we don't have an architect to design this school, right? All that comes from when we get in. But in general scale, I think that those are the terms I'd be comfortable sharing. Okay. And um, you mentioned uh, we would start with the long term. So now <laughs> let's go to the short or midterm. Sure. So we, we, we submitted a pretty assertive or aggressive capital plan for the Amherst Elementary Schools to the town and the Joint Capital Planning Committee of the town uh, government has been, in my opinion, very supportive of that plan. They asked lots of great questions, but one of the things is that we had no heat, no cooling. I mean, the school year at Wildwood last year, if you remember the last August, it was incredibly warm and, mm -hmm. and really uh, it was difficult to be there for the staff and the students. And it's really hard for me to get used to the idea that uh, our children are going starting school in August. <laughs> I mean, because it, it just, it just, in my whole experience, both my own school experience and most of the years I served in the legislature, we always thought of it as sometime after Labor Day, right. but we're now August. That is, and most districts also have moved to pre-Labor Day starts like us. Um, and so what we've, you know, one of the hard things to judge about some of the capital planning was that we are hoping to replace these buildings. So some of this is sunk cost, and how do we judge that? And so what we've landed with joint capital planning, they haven't voted yet, the town council, but in our proposal is to rent a portable unit. Uh, right now, since Wildwood was fixed last year, we feel like that's in pretty good shape. Fort River, we're, we're less clear in terms of the chiller and the life, uh, but have it actually housed at Fort River. And if there was a, an issue with the chiller, if it you know, um, has problems, we're ready, set to put the other one online. Mm -hmm. If there was a problem at Wildwood, it would, it, 
might take a day or two to get it over to the school, but uh, we work with companies that, that rent these portable chillers. Um, they would be fully sufficient to chill to cool the building. So that was a major issue last year. Additionally, we have um, other repairs that we want to make on the buildings um, that are they're not just about the cooling, but just improving the environment in the school. We're looking to rip up some of the carpeting at Wildwood, which is original to the building, make it a kind of healthier, uh, improve the air quality that there's been concerns about at Wildwood School. That already happened at Fort River. Um, continue to improve some of the water outlets. Um, we're certainly well, with le well below the EPA level, but we want to make sure our water is as healthy as it can be for our children. And one other thing that we're working on now is ADA upgrades. So we, we chose as a district to have uh, Americans with Disabilities Act um, audit done of all of our schools. And not surprisingly, given the age of the schools, there were many areas that we need to improve the accessibility. And we're particularly looking at, um, we did additional sessions where we got feedback from families, from staff, uh, and from the community that the access to the buildings and access to the playgrounds are two areas that were prime in terms of uh, major issues that we have and so we're looking to improve those next year as well in terms of the capital so while we are hoping to replace the buildings we we know there's a generation of kids in them right now and they can't wait five years for some of these uh, fixes to occur and that's how we're approaching it great so uh, we have just another minute or so <laughs> left uh, any other point that you would like to make that uh, sure. my questions haven't uh, <laughs> Uh, elicited from you? Sure. Well, I, I'm just incredibly appreciative of the support of the town of Amherst um, for supporting our budget. I think because of our budget, we're able to support our students' needs in ways that not everybody has that flexibility, not every school district has that flexibility. And because of that, you know, we get ranked highly. Um, recent now online ranking ranked our district as net ninth overall in the state and first in Western Massachusetts. And I can't separate that from the funding priority that the town places on its school. So I can, the last thing to say is just my deep appreciation and to let taxpayers know we're very careful with, with the funds that we come in and we put it directly as much as we can to student experiences where the needs are and we'll continue to do so. Terrific. So I just want to thank you for being with us tonight but I also as a resident of the community want to thank you and the school committee for the stability that you have brought to town because uh, uh, things were a little bit rocky there, and uh, we were looking uh, a little rough around the edges, and that I would say was not the Amherst way. So i um, very, very grateful for the uh, skillful work that you and members of the school committee have done to uh, restore uh, a sense of calm and uh, rationality uh, to this most critical uh, function in our town government. We spend the most money on our schools of anything uh, from our taxes, uh, and it has an extraordinarily important and critical uh, role in helping um, maintain uh, and build a self-governing society. And so I just want to thank you for your hard work. And I want to thank you all for joining us tonight. Hope you uh, learned a few things tonight. I certainly did. And we'll look forward to seeing you at another show.